Hello and good morning friends. Welcome to the CEC Edisit Live Lecture. Dear friends, with our ongoing series on women in history, today we would be talking on one of the most important topics. But before that, we would be continuing from the point where we have left uh, in our previous session. And afterwards, we would be talking on nationalism and the women's question in detail. And for this discussion, we have once again with us in our studios, Dr. Shruti Vip. Dr. Shruti Vip is Assistant Professor in Department of uh, history pgdav college evening university of delhi so let's welcome our guest dr shruti vip and let's try to grab maximum knowledge through her experience hello ma'am welcome to the discussion thank you Jitika. thanks for having me here uh, in today's lecture i would be uh, focusing on the role of women in the national movement and how one can trace the issues of patriarchy femininity and masculinity but before starting this, I would like to uh, discuss in some detail from where I left uh, last in the last lecture, that is Muslim reformist masculinity, because that also forms an important part of the entire discussion. Uh, as we were discussing, what was the impact of reform movements uh, on Indian women? So, uh, in that rubric, I had already discussed with you the impact on Hindu women. Uh, today, I would be discussing how Muslim women were impacted with this reformism that had started in 19th century and continued well into 20th century. Education for Muslim females <coughs> was justified on the ground that this would not only differentiate them from uh, Hindu women uh, who were steeped in ritualism, but would also imbibe a distinct identity. So it was with this uh, uh, background that uh, a discussion about educating Muslim women started. And from 1930s onwards, as the Muslim League entered into Punjab politics, the question of women's share in parental property became very important. And that too had to be decided within the Islamic law. Because it was the Islamic law that was uh, 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 giving uh, Muslim women right to acquire paternal property, whereas the tribal custom which was prevalent in these areas around Punjab did not really permit that. So this became a very important issue. Uh, uh, that was uh, discussed by Muslim community leaders. And uh, uh, widows wanted that marriages should be allowed uh, uh, even outside the family or uh, they even wanted continued widowhood for themselves with some land entitlements and they did not want to accept the uh, custom of levy rate, which I had discussed in the last lecture, which meant that a woman once her husband died, was bound to marry one of the family male, uh, one of the males of the family in which uh, she was residing. And Muslim women did not want to adopt this practice, which was rampant in and around Punjab. And uh, uh, it was in this background that one needs to take into account the stand taken by Muslim reformers. So they attempted to take recourse to uh, classical Islamic practices as were found in the medieval text Hidaya or in the Hanafi school of law. And the different marriage and inheritance customs among various communities like Mapilas or Memons were uh, now largely being considered un-Islamic. So there was a lot of, uh, 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 there was rising intolerance and uh, as a result women had no option but to take recourse to uh, litigation and they started uh, approaching courts uh, and this was done not only by Hindu widows but also upper class Muslim women and they started questioning family laws thereby exercising their agency. Now, uh, 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 coming to 1939, 
uh, Muslim women in 1939 in order to exercise their right of dissolution of marriages, which was quite difficult under Hanafi law, threatened that they would uh, uh, leave their uh, community groups and uh, hence they forced their uh, political leaders to grant an application of Maliki law which allowed this right. Uh, now coming to the issue of reformism among Muslims, uh, Urdu reading for women was banned by some reformers because Urdu literature cont uh, contained some uh, 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 romantic tracts and erotic literature and uh, therefore uh, it was not considered as appropriate for women. Uh, B. Ashrafunnisa later revealed how she taught herself to read Urdu secretly. Begum Rokea Hussain, who also wrote in Bengali to cater to Bengali Muslim girls, also gave similar accounts. Then there were a number of male authors like Nazir Ahmad Dehlavi, Maulana Ashraf Thanavi, who usually wrote novels in Urdu to create a pure uh, 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 Muslim image of uh, 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 mothers, wives, ideal homekeepers. So basically to imbibe purity, to imbibe uh, pious nature uh, amidst all that was going on became the prime focus of Muslim reformers and purification of Muslim women's language, ritual and domesticity was the most important agenda that was being carried forward. Then we have a number of important reformers and political leaders like Sayyid Ahmad Khan who encouraged home-bound female education and Mumtaz Ali uh, instilled the notion of gender equality as the distinctive hallmark of Islamic scripture, of Islamic knowledge and thought. Then uh, uh, not to miss the Begums of Bhopal who started a number of primary schools for Muslim girls despite great opposition from the Muslim community. This was definitely a very important step uh, towards the direction of educating Muslim women in colonial India. And Begum Rokia Sekhawat Hussain also patronized girl education in Patna and in Calcutta. So while so many efforts were being uh, uh, initiated by the social reformers, the important role played by Muslim women educationists and social reformers needs to be further researched and talked about in greater detail. Now coming to the drawbacks of uh, uh, socio-religious reform movements, uh, what impact they had on uh, the political uh, uh, developments that were taking place and what impact they had on the gender binaries that were uh, emerging as much stronger needs to be talked about. The revivalist movements of 19th century created an atmosphere of mutual suspicion and a sense of insecurity against each other and unconsciously contributed to the growth of rise of communalism, a point that we would be discussing in our future course of discussion. So uh, uh, as you have seen how there was a hardening of identities both among the Muslim community as well as the Hindu community. When one was discussing reforms related to women, it was Hindu scriptures that were being cited. And therefore, there was a call for back to Vedas, which were considered as true representative of Hindu culture and civilization and a great India, a reformed India. So in this entire scheme of things, Muslims could not really... Uh, identify themselves and they started uh, discovering and analyzing their own community practices and they started uh, putting their foot down uh, as far as their own religious uh, 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 developments and uh, uh, important uh, privileges were concerned. And among the Muslims, the school of Walilullah and the Deoband school uh, were active in restoring pristine purity and religious fervor among Muslim community. So therefore, the entire agenda of reformism uh, 
got enmeshed and entangled with revivalism and this was not a very healthy approach to bring about change in indian society since, since indian society was not made of any one particular community but it was a composite society but this commonness this uh, 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 uniformity was never really resorted to and humanism human values etc were not really talked about in much greater detail neither they were considered as important as what the scriptures referred to among the hindus the revival of shivaji and the ganapati festival the dharm sabha of radha kanta dev of calcutta they tried to glorify hinduism against the christianity but ultimately the communication gap was such that it sent a wrong message to the muslims which was further added by the shuddhi movement started by the arya samaj so the love for hindu ideals and institutions the pride in hindu religion and the philosophy contributed to the sense of superiority and also resulted in alienation the feeling of alienation among different uh, communities particularly among muslims who also started patronizing such alienating thoughts and practices thereby strengthening their own community uh, vivekanand said that vedant philosophy is the supreme of all philosophy so thereby negating the influence of different schools of thought different philosophies uh, that were uh, very uh, much uh, being patronized by other communities uh, so therefore uh, i would not be wrong if i say that uh, reformism uh, can also be associated in some way or the other with communalism the parallel reform movement of two communities had the common aim that is to protect and promote their own religion now uh, how this could be achieved uh, uh, this was achieved automatically since the two communities lacked communication and hence lost their ultimate aim of exterminating the outsiders the colonial regime the britishers so they were busy fighting contesting amongst themselves rather than against the colonial regime they failed to communicate their message to the masses the reason was that most of them belonged to the elite sections of society or the rising middle class who were well versed in english but they were not really able to communicate with the masses in their own language and style the economic backwardness of the country the backward outlook of uh, uh, people and the neglect of the masses as well as the neglect of the education further helped in widening this gulf between the rich and the poor the social religious reform movements uh, 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 emerged as a social and philosophical and a moral movement but also a religious movement now the moment religion came to be attached to these movements uh, uh, the real impact of these movements uh, became self uh, glorification and creation of rigid identities which again was a very limited and myopic goal it also prompted the british to misinterpret and use the communication gap between the communities for their policy of divide and rule hence a vicious circle started whereby this gap kept on increasing uh, finally one can say that uh, both the seclusion and the domestication of women became a common theme in the contemporary literature moral and political treatises that were being written sermons and various law codes that were being devised from time to time and historians have uh, often described this period as a time when public sphere of politics and work became increasingly male while the private sphere of home and family became increasingly female so this dichotomy between home and the outside world was further 
uh, strengthened during this entire socio-religious reform movement's phase. Now, coming to the next rubric, uh, uh, that is Indian nationalism and women. Uh, here, I would be discussing as to how uh, the theme of patriarchy, masculinity, femininity can be, uh, uh, is quite visible in the entire phase of national movement. That is, the movement that Indians started against the colonial regime. So, in this uh, entire course of discussion, uh, one has to keep in mind that not all anti-colonialism uh, is nationalism and not all nationalism was anti-colonial. Uh, a, a, a lot of focus uh, during this entire period was on Western educated Indians and nationalism, that is the middle class uh, Indians and how middle class nationalism ultimately shaped nationalism. And uh, 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 some very important questions that are associated with nationalism and uh, the entire process is that uh, why uh, did a class of people who were kind of uh, uh, doing well in the colonial regime, uh, uh, they were educated, uh, they were professionals, uh, lawyers, etc. Uh, uh, they had so much to benefit from the colonial regime, but they started opposing the Britishers and they started even even risking their careers and lives. So there was definitely a, a, a higher moral uh, uh, ground that was inspiring educated Indians to take a stand against the Britishers. Then secondly, uh, how this was being done, that is, what was it that e these Indians did to struggle against the Britishers? Then thirdly, what were the limitations, particularly with reference to rising communal tendencies in society, hardening of religious identities and what were the reasons for that. Now, uh, uh, since the establishment of the rule of English East India Company in Bengal in 1757 uh, and then another important landmark being uh, the Battle of Buxar, uh, that is 1764, uh, these two battles uh, kind of facilitated uh, the establishment of the rule of English East India Company, which continued till almost uh, 100 years. And the next uh, major landmark was the uh, uh, revolt of 1857. And uh, since this revolt of 1857 was led by Indian princes, later on joined by peasants who wanted to uh, uh, bring back the old order, uh, which was again uh, quite divided. Uh, and uh, had regional implications and uh, how uh, after this revolt of 1857, the Indian Act uh, 1858 that was passed by uh, the British Parliament resulted in major changes that came about uh, in the way uh, uh, India as a colony was to be perceived. Now, uh, henceforth, there was more focus on bringing about changes in Indian society uh, and also beginnings of English education and also an attempt to influence Indians, uh, both morally, philosophically, uh, socially also uh, and politically by uh, uh, giving them a uh, stick and carrot and also by promising that no more future political realignments will be done and no more uh, uh, annexationist policy uh, would be followed. So, uh, after 1857, uh, a number of associations of educated Indians started coming up and uh, uh, the prime mover uh, of the change came about in 1875, uh, sorry, in 1885 with the establishment of Indian National Congress. And henceforth started the moderate phase of nationalism, uh, which began by publishing newspapers, forming associations, and uh, uh, also uh, 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 it was steeped in ambivalent attitudes uh, in the beginning phase uh, of its uh, uh, political uh, struggle. And uh, most of the moderate leaders began to believe 
uh, British rule to be a positive achievement, uh, a beneficial uh, aspect came to be explored. And uh, uh, the reason being that Britishers would help Indians to modernize, bringing in new ideas. And uh, since they were themselves product of British institutions and British education, British uh, influence, they were wholeheartedly in support of the colonial rule. So initially, Indian National Congress petitioned and in drew up elaborate memorials and sent delegations to the British Parliament, arguing that the policies being followed in colonial India by the British uh, administrators were un-British. That is, they were not as liberal and as grand as the British were. And hence, they wanted to bring this to the attention of uh, British government and were expecting that gradually the things would improve. So, early days of Indian National Congress can be described as uh, a debating club of Indian elites who had a lot of hope uh, uh, and uh, they were expecting some positive change to come about uh, as a result of their association with the British uh, rule and uh, 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 the British institutions. Then uh, uh, the next important uh, phase was the extremist phase uh, as a result of various uh, colonial policies uh, which were uh, quite exploitative and they were also kind of derogatory for Indians. For example, the Ilbert Bill controversy, the Vernacular Press Act, etc. had definitely made Indians realize that how shallow uh, 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 all the talk of British liberalism was and how it was eventually uh, colonialism at end of the day which was dictating terms to them and there was nothing liberal or modern about it. So the leaders of Indian National Congress, uh, they started connecting colonialism and economic problems of the country. So therefore, the colonial critique uh, uh, of the British rule, uh, which was basically based on economic thought and ideas of exploitation began and uh, uh, so there was a chunk uh, within the Indian National Congress which began questioning the whole philosophy of beneficial aspect of British rule and they started uh, opening, de uh, uh, declaring uh, in an open manner that the British rule was not beneficial to Indians in any way and therefore uh, a, a counter movement uh, of extremist thought started, uh, uh, who were definitely more radical and uh, they wanted to bring it to the attention of Britishers that they could no longer continue to exploit, economically exploit Indians because they were uh, simultaneously theorizing on how exploitative British rule was. So uh, uh, the trend of public meetings started. And uh, uh, Tilak emerged as a very important leader in Western India, particularly Bombay, Pune, and he started using religious and folk festivals to convey the nationalist message. And uh, 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 many times the moderates kind of disapproved and thought that this was a dangerous trend and would not result uh, in any gains. So, uh, this was the time uh, from extremist phase onwards that religion and nationalism began to be uh, side by side, though the trend was much weaker in the beginning, but uh, as times progressed, it got fully entrenched. And uh, various strands of nationalism began to argue for their own religion, which was true not only for uh, Hindus, but also various other communities, Muslims also. Uh, now, a very important context for this critique of Western educated Indians uh, uh, that emerged was that they were rather in authentic and this was made both by the colonial officials and some other Indians also who had started suspiciously looking at the way national movement was progressing. So in this entire course of discussion, 
uh, and movement, religion came to be deployed in the nationalist project. And once religion came to be deployed, uh, the role of women became all the more myopic, became all the more limited and uh, uh, there were uh, definitely uh, uh, serious limitations that were uh, 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 that were devised and implemented also as far as women participation was concerned so a modernized middle class religiosity was born uh, which continued to exercise an important influence over the indian national movement uh, now, uh, various strands uh, uh, that emerged uh, in due course of time uh, also resulted in uh, uh, Hindu reformist organizations such as Arya Samaj who were opposed by uh, some other strands of uh, uh, nationalist movement also and Muslims made up a significant portion of the population at that point of time approximately 25% per and they came to resent the growing Hinduness of the Indian National Congress agenda. And by late 19th century, an important Muslim leader, Sir Syed Ahmad Khan, he initiated uh, uh, among Muslims a Western style of education while also professing loyalty to British. And his agenda was definitely not very different from the moderate Indian National Congress. Now, uh, it is also important to take into account various religious divisions that were emerging in nationalism. So, while initially Hindu and Muslim uh, nationalism emerged as complementary and it tried to create a stronger Hindu or a Muslim community that would make India stronger. Uh, and uh, Sir Syed Ahmad Khan had famously called Hindus and Muslims as two eyes of India. But growing revivalism among both the communities that we have clearly uh, seen in the course of our discussion on social religious reform movements, particularly in North India, often took on a more anti-Muslim character. As a result, by 1890s, there were uh, uh, major riots that were uh, developing and uh, uh, both the communities were adopting a hardening of stand in course of their nationalist struggle. And this entire process, it was women that were being made uh, uh, the scapegoats and uh, uh, moral codes were being written and morality was being entrusted on women as a very important uh, uh, benchmark to, uh, to uh, describe how they were different, how they were not only different but also superior to each other and how they could fight a colonial regime through this high moral ground. Now, uh, uh, having discussed these various aspects, uh, I would now like to make a passing reference to other important political developments that were going on like the partition of Bengal uh, and uh, the, the starting of revolutionary movement uh, uh, and then coming in of Gandhi about whom we would be discussing in our next module. Thank you.
coming to the aspect of feminist research and nationalism. Uh, here, uh, it is important to discuss a few key points as to how uh, feminist research can result in a different interpretation of nationalism and the role played by women. Uh, assumption of alliance between a feminist researcher and her female subjects is a very important uh, way of approaching a subject. Then production of knowledge is situated and relational that is whatever knowledge is being produced is already uh, being preconceived and these preconceived assumptions must be looked into. Then a less authoritative account or a partial account uh, is not a choice but a necessity. So therefore, it is important that historians, they start uh, discussing, they start exploring various ways of understanding less authoritative accounts who have not really made their entry into mainstream history writing, but they do exist and they are waiting for historians, for scholars to be explored more actively in a more meaningful manner. And then agency as performance. So therefore, here you can talk about uh, the women agency and how right from the mid 19th century or later 19th century itself, a women agency had started making its presence felt, but it was conveniently uh, uh, being overlooked by the male social reformers and later on by nationalist leaders. Then uh, identity as constructed and staged, that is whatever identities that were framed uh, as part of uh, various communities as well as as masculine and feminine were largely staged and it was not as if that was their true character. So one needs to explore the hidden character of the staged identities. Now coming to the aspect of nationalism and women's question, the ideological save through which European ideas of reformed passed through uh, had a lot of emphasis on <clears throat> the role or the position that women enjoyed in India and this was made a major uh, uh, theme of debate by the colonial masters and as the prime mover for their justification to continue ruling uh, a backward country like India which did not give its women folk pride and equal rights. Uh, there was a lot of emphasis on difference with the West. So the colonial masters projected uh, the uh, oriental society as being backward and as completely regressive and totally different from the so-called modern uh, uh, upcoming uh, educated society of the western world. So women's question began to be situated in the inner domain of sovereignty away from the political unrest and any contest with the colonial state. Now this happened once the nationalist leaders became more active and became more radicalized in their opposition to the colonial regime. So now they declared that the colonial masters had need not have any say in the internal matters pertaining to Indian society and women was the most important pillar, the pillar of strength, the core which protected Indian society. So therefore, they started objecting to any interference by the colonial regime in framing laws or reforms or devising uh, strategies in order to bring about a change in the lives of women. So discovery of tradition was the next logical step that is instead of the idea uh, of supporting the civilizing mission of the colonial regime an attempt was made to discover what was pure, what was traditional 
in Indian society and then trying to bring about change in the lives of women with reference to those traditions, scriptures, morality, etc. So, women's question was uh, taken out of the realm of negotiation with the colonial state. So, the nationalist leaders did not want to negotiate with the colonial masters on any issues related to women. A trend started by uh, Tilak and then later on carried forward by various other reformers. So, therefore, uh, the nationalist agenda that emerged, it subjugated female sexuality and women's demand for freedom. It required the sacrifice of female lives and bodies to a cause that violated the interests and desires of individual women. So, therefore, it expected women to conform to a national construct within which men reigned supreme. So, therefore, while the nationalist uh, leaders were uh, responsive to the exploitation that was being faced by women uh, as a part of uh, social uh, practices that had been continuing since generations. But for them, the ultimate aim was to win the freedom first and all these causes related to women could be taken up later, number one. Number two, it did not want to compromise with the colonial regime on the issues of women at any count because they wanted uh, some aspects of their lives, some aspects of their struggle to remain purely personal uh, and also uh, private and also rooted in the family. So, therefore, this dichotomy that emerged uh, uh, by the end of 19th century got further uh, uh, strengthened in course of 20th century. So, uh, a while on the one hand, the colonial uh, masters were raising issues like saving brown women, that it was very important that Indian women uh, uh, could be saved from the clutches of uh, uh, the deprivation from the clutches of exploitation and the colonialists uh, described uh, uh, the condition of Indian women as not only uh, uh, being one marked by degradation but also inferiority and they declared that the entire cultural tradition of India had reduced women to nothing. And therefore, they had this uh, mission to bring about a change in Indian society and hence they had to continue ruling Indians for time to come. Now, the problem of tradition already had been constituted by the colonial state. So, therefore, uh, while the colonialists were approaching tradition from a dif different point of view, the reformers and the nationalists were approaching tradition from a completely different point of view and for trying to justify what was right in Indian tradition and what was uh, not wrong in Indian way of life. So, what emerged as Partha Chatterjee uh, has discussed in, in his work is uh, the emergence of two spheres. So, one sphere was the material sphere, the sphere uh, of science and technology, economics, statecraft and uh, it was all right to imitate the western civilization in this domain that is in the material sphere. So, Indians could accept the material sphere as being of some value and they could devise ways and means to adopt that in their lives and in the political struggle that lay ahead so that they could also compete with the world. Whereas the other sphere that is the spiritual sphere uh, according to them uh, the, the spiritual sphere of the eastern civilizations of the orient was far more superior and this referred to the national culture, the high moral ground and it was in this realm that women were to play a very important and active role as nurturers. So, women were declared as nurturers of 
the spiritual sphere and uh, superimposed onto the uh, onto the concepts of outer and inner sphere was the social space of home and the world so home emerged as the uh, uh, as the representative of the spiritual sphere whereas uh, uh, the world emerged as the stage for the material sphere now uh, what was the role played by the women in a new patriarchy also needs to be discussed uh, neither westernized nor the oppressed object of indigenous patriarchy uh, became uh, 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 the point of discussion and what emerged in course of time was the new middle class which clearly associated itself with the more developed and more evolved uh, outside sphere the world uh, that was truly being represented by the western world since it meant a command over english it meant a new kind of education which would uh, give them jobs and would also enable them to become efficient to uh, struggle against the colonial rule and it was in this background that education for women began to be uh, uh, promoted and as against introduced by the christian missionaries so uh, this idea of women education not only patronized by christian missionaries but as a result of indigenous efforts became a, a very popular idea and uh, uh, as a result by uh, beginning of 20th century and though some developments were also made in this regard by the end of 19th century uh, 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 a positive trend started and as a result the virtues of freedom and self emancipation they came to be linked to national sovereignty so when one is talking about freedom it definitely did not mean political freedom it meant spiritual freedom and when one was talking about spiritual freedom it also meant uh, freedom to exercise uh, social practices that had been part of indian civilization culture since long uh, as a result there was a, a talk of inculcation of certain values values like discipline values like thrift cleanliness also some modern ideas modern practices had to be adopted like accounting in order to survive in colonial regime and in order to grab some limited jobs that were available as a result new forms of dressing and clothing also came to be patronized and soon educated indians began developing a taste for refined uh, way of life refined tastes and also started adopting uh, the way white men behaved and lived now in this background how nationalist ideology uh, uh, emerged and what was its impact on women uh, a, a, a very important change that came about or rather uh, a continuum which was already uh, existing was the fixing of feminine and masculine qualities the home and the world came to be projected as binaries and the material and spiritual spheres came to be explained as completely divergent one could be controlled by the colonial regime unwillingly the other could not be even touched upon by the britishers since it belonged to the private domain over which only indian males had control therefore women came to be projected as goddess or mother and there was a complete eradication of sexuality in the outside world even in the spiritual domain there was a complete eradication of any kind of sexuality and women began to be projected as uh, uh, as a symbol of nation as a sign of nation and the image of bharat mata that emerged uh, during this period uh, has a lot to say uh, in this regard so uh, 
while this trend was uh, uh, on the go, uh, a simultaneous development that was taking place was the absence of an autonomous women's movement. And even if it existed, it was not really taken into account, it was not really talked about. So, the feminist struggles waged in the home, that is, uh, 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 in the form of various private letters that were written, biographies, autobiographies, art, uh, cultural artifacts and literature. So, these are the various sources that are there and uh, many historians have resorted to the study of these resources and they have developed uh, a very clear and a very unbiased understanding of how women were seeing themselves and what was the role played by them silently or not so silently during this entire nationalist discourse. So, while the nationalist discourse was about women, women were not uh, allowed to speak or even if they were speaking, they were not being heard, they were not being given a platform and it is for the feminist research, it is for the, uh, for the historians to explore these uh, 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 private uh, papers and uh, these new kind of sources that are there in order to explore uh, the, uh, what was uh, the ground reality. Now coming to the aspect of gender and Indian nationalism, uh, uh, as discussed uh, earlier, the family emerged as a, as a contained as, and as an arena of silence. So, uh, silence of all kinds was encouraged in the uh, institution of family and family came to be projected as a metaphor of the nation. Uh, now, in developing this metaphor, uh, definitely there are limits of the archives because the archival material does not really account for so many non-conventional sources that were there that we have just talked about. But it is for the historians to explore those unconventional sources and to compare the relationship between the women's question and nationalism. Now coming to the issue of tools of feminist uh, historiography, uh, one can talk about the importance of shifting identities. That is, identities cannot be uh, understood as given or as uniform because they were being devised from time to time. Identities should be taken as multiple, contradictory, partial and also uh, having an influence of conflicting uh, social and linguistic influences. Uh, then also there was contingency of speech that is whenever something was being said uh, was not really uh, it was not as if it meant what was being said. So what was the hidden agenda also needs to be explored and this would involve an understanding of the entire socio-political, cultural genesis of thought and also the historicity uh, uh, around it. Uh, as has been pointed out by Kamala Vishweshwaran, uh, silence sometimes uh, has a very important role and uh, it is a marker of women's agency. That is, if women choose to remain silent, it also means that they are speaking and it means that they are resisting. So, silence should be seen as resistance and if there is no archival record, that also means that uh, women were speaking a lot uh, even while not getting recorded. Uh, as and Kamala Vishweshwaran has given examples of women like Uma and Janaki who refused to speak of their child marriage, who refused to speak of the experiences of child marriage and who refused to be identified as a spinster or as a widow. So for them, their identity as a woman was far more important and complete as compared to these 
identities and uh, by uh, disallowing their identification as child widows both uma and janki they shaped their agency uh, and they kind of uh, matured and came uh, came about on their own so according to kamla vishveshwaran when a subject refuses to historicize themselves for example women in colonial india they are refusing to tell their own experiences their history and also of the nation and to refuse to be a subject is to refuse the nation and the work of the subject is inevitably the work of the collective so unless and until this realization dawns upon uh, a completely unbiased history cannot really be uh, talked about now uh, coming to the issue of dichotomy between home and the outside world partha chatterjee uh, has discussed that how most of the nationalist discourses were gendered and nationalism rather created a new patriarchy rather than countering it rather than weakening it so the entire nationalist discourse resulted in further hardening of stand against women in a very subtle way and this new patriarchy fused national integrity with the ideal of female chastity with the ideal of female purity the pious woman the ideal of bharat mata so preservation of the home or the nation was embodied in the very physical person of the woman so as a result this uh, uh, heavy uh, burden that was now uh, laden on the shoulders of women had to be carried all all along in the course of the national movement uh, coming to uh, the gandhian phase uh, since that was the most uh, uh, you know a crucial phase of indian national movement where various new strategies were uh, devised and uh, uh, women were uh, involved in a big way uh, in the uh, participation uh, in various mass struggles and various movements that were uh, devised uh, since uh, 1919 uh, continuing till 19 42 so uh, a lot uh, 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 a lot many new developments happened and mahatma gandhi expanded anti colonial agitations into mass movements of peasants tribal and middle class uh, 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 participation uh, increased and from the early 1920s uh, a, a, a non violent non cooperation movement started against the colonial regime and women joined in this movement uh, on a large scale uh, altering the very character of congress organizations uh, now this signified an open and an active female defiance of social norms that had traditionally restricted women to their homes so in a way it was definitely a step ahead for women because they were coming out of their homes they were participating in picketing of shops they were also managing violent mobs they were trying to give a direction to uh, uh, to the agitation and gandhian politics also involved strategic use of traditional kinship practice and emotions for example during the khilafat movement in 1921 the mother of the ali brothers a woman from an orthodox muslim family began to address large crowds of muslims who were protesting the british abolition of the turkish caliphate after the war now once uh, addressing uh, the meeting as uh, uh, you know everyone present here is like my son uh, 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 the mother of ali brothers defied the principle of female seclusion as she at first spoke from behind the veil and addressed the crowds as her children and later on unveiled herself now this was a major uh, 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 image makeover that was uh, 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 coming about for a muslim woman to unveil herself in public but this could be done because the cause was of uh, 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 national movement the cause was anti colonial so women could definitely transgress boundaries 
and could assume a more open and a more confrontationist and a more active uh, role. Uh, then uh, coming to the issue of uh, various national movements, uh, the struggle that was uh, devised by Mahatma Gandhi uh, from 1921 onwards, the non-cooperation movement in 1921 and then the civil disobedience movement in 1931 uh, continuing till 1934. Uh, uh, many peasant movement, uh, many sorry, many peasant women were mobilized and local organizations and movements were kind of fused uh, and various women along with men quoted arrest and led demonstrations. They also made illegal salt. So, uh, in this course of agitation, middle class women, they became public speakers, they actively participated in demonstrations, they even quoted arrest. For example, Swaroop Rani, who was mother of Jawaharlal Nehru, was beaten by police during uh, this agitation as were a number of women. The Quit India movement of 1942 also uh, resulted in a strengthening of underground networks of various women and uh, it also kind of encouraged radicalism. But this new radicalism among women as most of the national uh, movement leaders were behind bars. Uh, after 1942, uh, this radicalism did not translate into a new political femininity as Gandhian nationalism uh, clung to the image of the woman as a self-sacrificing and a nurturing mother. So, uh, what needs to be discussed is the ambivalences in Gandhian ideology. So far, a detailed discussion has been undertaken on the rising participation of women during Gandhian mass mobilizations, but one needs to understand with greater detail and critical outlook as to what were the ambivalences that were implicit in this women participation, which would be the theme of my next lecture. Thank you. With this note, thank you ma'am. Thank you so very much for de delivering a very, very productive uh, session and uh, dear friends, we believe that your feedbacks are very, very important for us. Do write to us at uh, info.cc at the rate nic.in. The lecture is going to be uploaded on YouTube soon and dear friends, afterwards, if you feel that you have any query or if you want to have uh, answer to any of your questions, definitely you can write to us and we will try to give answers to your questions when next time Dr. Shruti Vip visits us studio. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you once Thank again. Thank you, Geetika.